And good evening, folks. Uh, this is the Eye of the Storm podcast with myself and Dan Ascani. It is Sunday, February the 26th, 2023. And as I discussed earlier, uh, what we're looking for to do tonight is to basically just have an open discussion about the markets, but more in line with how markets seem to go unhinged. In other words, they're not moving congruently with one another in terms of what we're looking at it, that the interest rates are moving in one direction and the equity markets were very stubbornly not declining as we felt that they should have. And so what we want to discuss tonight is really kind of what maybe was happening behind the curtain or what we call behind the curtain, because there are many different factors that were in motion at that time, which again, get reflected in the prices, get reflected in option prices, and then in turn in the underlying prices, which in most cases are the ES, the SPX, the NDX, the NQ, uh, and all of the individual options within a lot of these, the underlying companies or the component uh, companies within these indexes. And then again, we see that same type of movement happening because over in the interest rate sector or the treasuries, there are options that also expire several times a week within the 30-year bond, the 10-year note, the five-year note, the two-year note, the Fed funds. And so we're seeing a lot of movement in the Fed funds, a lot of movement in the two-year note, a lot of movement across the board in the treasuries that don't always seem to sync up with what the equity markets are doing. So we have found that there's a little bit being disjointed, so to speak, between the markets. And then again, we're seeing, and in my view, moves that I should be seeing or that we should be seeing within, say, the US dollar. That if interest rates are indeed climbing again, then the necessity for dollars to climb is very apparent. And so we're going to try to discuss that, pull it all together to kind of give a much, a little bit easier picture or a clearer picture of what is happening behind the curtain, so to speak. And so uh, what we're going to do is basically just have an open discussion. And we're going to start with uh, what Dan has already got a lot of that he wants to uh, talk about and bring to the table, so to speak, in terms of just giving a little bit of clarity. And a lot of that rolls around option Greeks. And many people that don't trade options don't really have an idea of what, what are we talking about. And the Greeks are just because of the Greek letters. And so we have Delta, Gamma, Theta, Rho, Vega, Vanna, and they keep coming up with new ones. And so it's very important to understand these and how they function and then how that comes into play in the movement of the underlying. Because each one, as they start to change, show is a representation of what's happening to the price. So again, Dan, thank you very much for, for coming in again today. I really do enjoy our conversations and hopefully uh, I already know that several of our viewers also really enjoy the conversation. So let's just pick up on where we left off. And that is basically kind of going over what happened last week. And uh, after last week's podcast, uh, we were both saying how the equity markets seemed to be disregarding the reality of what was happening and that we were noticing that the fund funds were marching in one direction and the market was saying, well, okay, fine. But that got caught up and basically really kicked in on Friday because of the PCE data. So, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Michael. Love it. You're welcome. Having a good time with these. Yeah. So, why don't we start just by going over the what you're using or what you're seeing in terms of you know, you, people have heard us both talk about Gammageddon, Volmageddon, and now we're adding another one called Vanageddon, you know, all the different things, because there are these mini explosions within these 
calculations that are producing massive changes in options positions and forcing these these big swings because traders and dealers have to hedge they have to adjust their positions so why don't we just kind of pick up from what you were talking about then but we're going to add a more in-depth conversation about what is Ro, what is vanna and how does this all fit into this picture called option pricing Yes, and why that's so important, because a couple of years ago, option volume began to exceed the total volume on the New York Stock Exchange, which is phenomenal. So whether you trade options or not, there may be many listeners who don't and never will. Options are helping move the market, and Michael and I will talk about a little bit about why. But what's happening is volume has come up so high in options it's exceeded what's going on in the stock market most of the time one reason for that is you know we entered a bear market about a year ago you know the market peaked on january 3rd 2022 and i think you had some pretty astute institutions and investors buying put options as insurance you know put options are designed to go up when the underlying stock or the market goes down so they buy put options to ensure their portfolio. You don't have to sell your portfolio or sell a bunch of your stock. You can just hold it and, and hedge it, you know, as the theory. So what's happened is that plus the huge increase in short-term option trading, not just like the gamma squeezes we saw a couple of years ago from, you know, traders betting on AMC and GameStop, but also the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, you know, the exchange is adding, filling in the gaps, actually, of, of expiring options such that they expire every day now. So I think it was as of last October when the C filled in and the, C the CBOE filled in the options um, for Tuesdays and Thursdays. Now we have options expiring every day. Yes. Those are referred to as zero DTE options. Yes. meaning zero days to expiration options. And that's really changed the picture here in addition to what I was just saying about record option volume. So what you're seeing is a lot of institutions and investors playing these zero DTE options because let's say when Globex opens, when the futures open at 6 p.m. Eastern time at night, you can have you can see institutions or investors putting on options that expire tomorrow before the close right so you don't have to deal as much with margin you don't have to deal as much with anything because they expire by tomorrow's close and that's helping not only speculators i think give, give them a tool to speculate in but also an additional tool for institutions to hedge their portfolios so let's say there's a number coming out like last week we had a couple of inflation numbers uh, ending with Friday's PCE number, that's the Federal, Federal Reserve's favorite inflation gauge, the PCE, which came out a little hotter than expected Friday. You might have institutions wanting to hedge that risk mm -hmm. by buying zero DTE options, either expiring tomorrow or maybe the end of the week. So you're getting a lot of movement out of the market based on these zero DTE options. It's really changed the intraday picture I don't think it's going to change the overall picture, but if you're a day trader, even if you don't trade options, it's hard to ignore what the effect they're having on the markets. So when you have a number coming out like Friday, where the PCE inflation gauge, the Fed's favorite gauge, came out hotter than expected, the market's selling off, but then it hit certain points, which we can go over. I don't want to make this a lecture, Mark, Mike. Let's make this a conversation here. But yeah. certain points in the market, for example, the ES, the, the uh, S&P E-mini futures, came down to around the 3950 area. That was support based on the option structure and also maybe some other things. But based on support there, right? the market just really failed to follow through more to the downside than it probably could have had it been a, a, a more... A higher volume day. So one characteristic of Friday's trading after that number came out is volume was light. Mm -hmm. You're really missing a lot of the so-called macro traders, those who look at the macro picture, the overall picture, and say, 
I've got to sell stock or I've got to buy stock, whatever they're saying. A lot of those traders are basically missing Friday, and we were dealt with a day of fairly low volume, it's thin trading. Right. So the S&P didn't break down. Part of that's the option structure. We can go over that as we talk, but basically that's part of what's happening here. Agreed. But now we've talked about this a couple of times where the macro traders, and again, macro traders are the institutionals, the, the uh, retail, but they're traders that carry positions and they react to what is happening in the macroeconomic window. So, you know, higher interest rates, how do I need to trade? So they come in and they position for that, or, you know, expecting a downturn, they come in and they position for that, you know, and they're missing. And so we get the news, like, like we both said, that we get the PCE coming out, and we're expecting them to show up, either to adjust their positions, or to create new positions in advance of what now is expected to come from the Fed in March. So we're not really, and even if they're just going to work it on a Friday to Friday expiration basis, they're not even doing that. Because again, we both follow volume. And we're not seeing the volume come in. But I will tell you where I am seeing the volume come in. So I don't know if they're not just paying attention or they're not willing to necessarily trade the S&P or the NASDAQ as an index, but I do think they're coming in in the queues, in the spiders, and in a lot of the individual components. For example, Tesla, Apple, a lot of the different stocks within these indexes have gained tremendous volume and it's almost daily. So again, I have the same question. Where are these macro the macro traders that we were they were dependable? Because when we would see them in action, we would see it via the volume numbers. We would see them come in, um, and we're not. So, I mean, what what is your feeling on that? I mean, what do you are they just sitting out there with a bad position? <laughs> and they, um, part, part of it is this happens during bear markets. The market declines like it has the last year yeah not just declining all the time but you know you get you get these bear market environments where there's just not a lot happening every day there's not a catalyst for macro traders to come in that's one factor the other factor is a lot of there's a lot, a lot of smart people out there they know if they're running institutional money or whatever they know that it's difficult for the market to stage much of a sustainable rally when the fed is still hiking you know, there's the age-old adage, don't fight the Fed. And for years during the bull market and when the Fed was lowering interest rates, that meant the Fed's lowering rates, don't fight them. You got to go with the uptrend. But now it's the opposite. Fed's raising rates and they're not done yet. And they're very clear on their message. So there's a lot of smart people out there. They understand that it's difficult for the market to sustain much of a rally. It's difficult to give up the cash and committed to the market in a big way such that there's big volume and a big volume rally. Instead, you've got overnight money market funds now paying, treasury money market funds paying 5%, 5.02, 5.05, depending on the fund. Right. So, so now you can sit there and say, you know, fixed income and money market competes with equity returns or expected equity returns. And that's important. It doesn't mean stocks can't rally, but it does mean that the macro traders, to answer your question, you know, where are they? It's difficult for them to come in in a big way when you can get interest overnight like that right. and or whatever else they're doing for cash management. And when the Fed is raising rates and it's very difficult for the market to sustain much of a rally. Right. And I, I think that's a very good point because when the, when the decline first happened, so, and we saw it, more last year than we are seeing it this year that initially the the macro traders got out of their longs and we saw that volume wise we saw a lot of switching going on volume wise and maybe it could have been get out of the long start putting on shorts ver through various instruments that are available and now exactly what you're just saying is that hey you know the market is going to ebb and flow. That's pretty normal. That not pretty normal. That is normal for a market. It rarely will it go straight down. 
unless we have a very good reason to crash. And that may be coming up. For all we know, it may be coming up. But even when it does that, it's not going to go straight down. There will be periods of buying and selling. The other thing that I want to add into this is, again, when because as you mentioned, to start the conversation, we have noticed and we have seen now volumes in options and derivatives is outsizing the available or the availability of the underlying. And so I think that a lot of what's going on right now is taking place because many or much of the expirations, particularly in our indexes, are cash settled. So it's not like they're buying a, a stock and then to get out of this or even to trade options, it normally can settle into the stock. It's at a price, but it settles cash, but it settles into, into the stock. So it's a surrounding what's happening in the stock. So we could see that volume in the stock and not necessarily in an overall picture. This makes sense to what I'm saying. I'm, I'm hoping it does, because I'm just trying to relate to, to what I see happening and how a lot of the derivatives now are cash settled. So there's a difference, I think, in between what gets traded now. All the volatility, all those volatility options, they don't, what does it settle into? Volatility? No, it settles into cash. You know, so does that have a play here? I think that makes it easier for players to play those types of vehicles because you don't have to deal with if it didn't settle in cash, receiving the underlying in, in delivery and then dealing with the margin for the underlying because you right. bought something that caused delivery in the underlying. So if it settles in cash, it's a lot easier to deal with. You don't have to worry about necessarily having the margin for the, receive the underlying or depending on what the situation is, receive or deliver it and it settles to cash. That, that may be making it a little bit easier for them to play these particular vehicles. Yeah, I agree. And I think that that in turn can have an effect on exactly how we're going to be interpreting different things. And, and when, but, but we are seeing the markets move on way less volume that we would anticipate. And right. that might even help it move more when the volume is thin, it, it can get exaggerated moves. Not a, not maybe we know that's what happened because <laughs> we've been trading we've been traders long enough that that we fully understand that in a thin market, if somebody has to come in and they and they've got five hundred thousand shares or five hundred futures to buy, and there's nobody really out there to do it, you'll see the suddenly surge, and then decline and it comes right back down, and right. so yeah, I I think when we put it all together. It's not aiding to what our picture might be. It's not It's not really helping out in terms of like, hey, we, we're only seeing really one side trading, and that's the side that is more surrounding zero DTE options or just surrounding the options movement. So let's just shift real quick. Now, talking about options movement, that I would just like to maybe go give a little description. We've talked about Delta. Everybody knows what Delta is. You know, point for point or what percentage, if you get a one point move in the underlying, what the price of this option is, what's going to happen to this option. Okay. And we know what gamma basically is, is a tool that's used to show you with a, a one point move, what that's going to change in your delta, et cetera, et cetera, to the strike. So in other words, it's like you may have an out of the money option that suddenly becomes in the money and your delta is now moving one for one with the stock, and your gamma explodes on you. So people get that concept. But now, and, and then theta, which is nothing more than decay in the option, aka premium. So we all got that understanding. But now I want to toss in Rho and Vanna. And those are two that you and I have talked about. But I think when we start talking about it, people are like, what are those? So I'm going to ask if you wouldn't mind filling in that blank. 
So we're going to take a Greek foreign language class here, right? So, I know, right? Yeah, basically, yes. <laughs> and and I don't want to lose everyone here. So, you know, we're really geeking out here by these numbers, but this is very important and not that everyone has to pay attention to it. But we just said that a couple of years ago and even now that a lot of the times volume on the, the options exchange is exceeding that of the entire New York Stock Exchange, which to me is phenomenal. Right. You got the tail wagging the dog here in a certain respect. Very much so. so. These option Greeks you're talking about are very important to institutions and astute investors who know how to deal with those and know what they are. And I don't know if I want to give a whole class on this right now, but what you have is hedge book management. What you have is managing the risk in the market. So you've got the underlying stock, let's say it's Apple or something, and you have an option. Let's say a put option, somebody buys to hedge Apple. So the delta is a Greek letter that we use to measure the change in the option based on the underlying. So if the delta is 50, for example, and Apple stock moves one point, the option is going to move half a point. So the delta is just simply measuring how much is the option likely to move compared to the underlying. And this goes for any stock or for any commodity or for the S&P 500 or the SPY, you know, the, the right. spider right. Um, ETF. Um, so delta is the change in the option uh, versus the underlying and gamma is the change in delta. And you start getting to these second order derivatives that are important to institutions and to you and me, but explaining them to people so that they can understand is another story and is important. Not that everyone has to understand this, but you have to understand, I think, that it's going on. So if you're trading the market, whether it's future stocks or whatever, these options are helping power moves in the market because right. market makers and dealers who have to manage their hedge book during this kind of volatility that we're seeing, huge volatility increase starting, you know, at least a year ago when the market collapsed into a bear market, volatility increased. So that means every day, if you're a market maker or a dealer coming in, the market's moving big time. You've got some hedge book management to do. You've got a lot of hedge book management to do. And so they're watching those Greeks. They're watching Delta. They're watching Gamma, which is the change in Delta. And they're watching what you were mentioning before also, Theta, which is the decay in premium, in premium over time. Right. Then you have second order derivatives. And again, we're getting pretty esoteric here. So I won't spend a lot of time on it, but Vanna and Charm, for example, Vanna being how much the option is going to change based on change in volatility. Right. So when the market uh, uh, volatility, when the market volatility changes, that changes the hedge book equation to oversimplify this here. And then you, <laughs> I can just keep going on and on. The basic point is there's a lot going on. And it's it's partly hedge book management by dealers, market makers, and so to speak. And that's helping move the market. And that's why you, you, last week, for example, we were talking about Friday when the PCE, the, the, the Fed's favorite inflation index number came out. Mm -hmm. The market didn't crash. I mean, it went down. But, you know, you had a certain option structure. You had option expiration. You had a lot of things to deal with on thin volume. So the market didn't collapse. A lot of that was hedge book management. So I hope I... At the risk of oversimplifying this whole thing, I hope it didn't also. No, not at all. The only thing I, I really want to add to the people understand is that what Dan is describing in terms of the gamma and the delta and et cetera, et cetera, it's changing your the size of your position. So in other words, when, when we have a market that suddenly you're seeing the surge in one direction and a, in, in any of the components, right, which in turn will affect the index that in which it sits and because our indexes are all uh capitalized the the cap cap weighted indexes at least the s p and the nasdaq and the dow and the russell so and what that suggests is that if if apple is worth two trillion dollars it's going to sit at the top of that weight waiting so every time and and this is no joke folks and you can watch this if you look at Apple, suddenly will move six cents, six cents to 10 cents can equal six to $10 in the, in the NASDAQ future. 
And so when that happens and Apple then moves a dollar and suddenly your, your option that you were short is now suddenly increased in Delta because it's, you're getting closer to the, to the actual strike price, then now your gamma explodes. So when we talk about a gamma explosion, it's nothing more than forcing the holders or the dealers to adjust their positions, which is what you were talking about, their hedge book, what they need to do at particular levels. And, and if they don't, they're gonna get slaughtered. So they don't really get a choice here about do you want to do you want to adjust your position to to the movement and because we have these swings in the market going in all both directions quickly I think there's a lot based on how the options are trading how volatility is being affected within that and then we have volatility options and as they make adjustments to that, that filters back down through to, okay, what do we need to do in the S&P? What do we need to do in the NASDAQ and these various indexes? We better go do it because their positions are based on that. And as these things move around and because, correct me if I'm wrong, because the volumes in derivatives, including all the volatility products and all the ETFs, that's what's really dictating the whole picture. It's, it's, it's like, it's not that somebody has suddenly turned bullish or bearish. They're reacting to what's happening right in front of them. They're reacting to what's happening to their position accordingly to how all these different things flip and move around. Now, right. okay, you had something you wanted to add there because I was going to switch <laughs> to the next Greek. <laughs> oh no, we're still doing a foreign language class here. We're still, huh? we're still in the foreign language class because this one I think is really actually important. And even though our option traders, they don't necessarily understand row or how that comes into play. And it's like because really for the last 13 years prior to January of 2022, they didn't have to worry about it. We lived in, and this is a major thing, so maybe we should have started here, that we lived in a low interest rate environment, incredibly low interest rate environment, almost hinging on going negative on us. And I think if somebody, if we could just really wrap ourselves around what Roe tells us and how that affects the price of the option and how that again affects the option position, which again affects the underlying, which could be the S&P, the SPX, the ES, the NQ, the NDX, et cetera, et cetera. Not alone, also affect all of the component companies within these indexes. So you can see how the picture gets bigger and bigger and suddenly it's, it's, and then you get somebody on, our financial media is saying, that's a bull market or it's a bear market. It's like, no, they don't switch and flip quite that fast. But options positions do. So please, <laughs> tell us all about Roe. <laughs> and you're right. I, I don't think we had to worry about Roe as much as we have the last year. And the reason for right. that is Roe is, Ro is a measure of the change of an option according to a change in interest rates basically a one percent change would in you, rates would you repeat that Ro is a, basically an expected change in the option price based on the change in interest rates a one percent change for so for every one percent change in rates an option price is going to change and that's because everything is really interrelated you know inter, interrelated in, in market interrelationships you know interest rates to stocks to commodities, to foreign currency, everything's related. And, uh, and and so there's these measures, and this is the Greek lesson we're having here. Everything's related to what's it's happening. It's a good one though. <laughs> yeah. Again, I hope we don't lose people because this is very complex and esoteric. We're trying to simplify this as much as possible, but Basically, the moral of the story is I think there's different measures and then we assign Greek letters to those measures 
that that go into what changes the price of options, the premium and options and so forth, and how that affects the underlying. So a put option in Apple, for example, that institutions or investors use as a hedge to their long Apple stock is now going to be affected by many things. And you're talking about row right now that that's affected by interest rates. We're, we've been talking about Vanna and uh, Charm and other second order derivatives that are that are affected by uh, the, the change by volatility and so forth. And then just basically how does an option change when the underlying moves? There's a lot of things going on here and it's happening fast. Yeah. Because we have not seen in 2022, we have not seen that big of a drop in bond prices or that sharp of a rise in interest rates as we did in 2022. We haven't seen that much volatility sustained through an entire calendar year in years since in 2022. So since maybe, I think it's the crash of 08, 09, we haven't seen this much volatility as we did in 2022. Right. So these factors are extremely important for institutions to pay attention to, and especially to market makers. Now, market makes a dealer who's making a market in whatever it is, the option or the underlying, and they've got, they're not here to speculate on the direction of the market. They're here to make a market. So when they put on their hedge book, they've got to make sure they've, they're they they're hedging that for future market movements. And I think important thing to realize here, not to leave off on that concept too soon here, but People, uh, I think, should make sure that they understand that when you put in, a, put on a trade, somebody's on the opposite side of that. It's not like right. it's a casino. There's the house. There's no house here. You're in a battle against the other side of the trade, against other traders, really. So when you buy a put option to hedge your stock, let's say you're worried about Apple going down and you own it, you might buy a put option to hedge it. Who's on the other side of that put option? Who... Who sold you the put option that you bought? It's a market maker. So you have a put option to hedge your Apple stock. The put option is designed to go up when Apple goes down. It was on the other side of that, the market maker. So the market maker sold you that put option. That's what he's there for. That means the market maker is now short a put option. And he's on the opposite side of the market as you. So yes, your long Apple stock, you hope it goes up, but you bought the put as a hedge. And if it goes down, your hedge pays off. But it, but it, for the market maker, it's going to go against the market maker because he sold you the put. So if the put option is going up and the market maker sold you the put, it's now going against him. So what does he do? He sells the underlying. He sells yeah. Apple shares. And, very, and he puts on the position. Confusing, it's a very confusing concept for people to try to understand. Why, if somebody sells me the put, it's like you have to understand what that action is, folks. If I sell you a put, I'm giving you the right. I'm giving you the right to sell me the stock at that strike price. And so what is the hedge against me having to buy that stock at that strike price? To sell it ahead of time. I don't really, if I'm giving you, it's like, if I'm selling the put, trust me, I want the stock to go down. <laughs> and a lot of people, they don't understand that because it's an opposite action. Not only that, but all the Greeks we were talking about, the Delta is going to move, the Gamma is yeah. going to move, the Vanna, all that stuff, volatility is going to move depending yeah. on what the market does. So the market maker has sold you the put. The market's going down. The put's going against him. He's selling the underlying. And now let's say volatility increases or interest rates or the Fed does something and makes it even worse. The market maker's not here to speculate on market direction. So they're going to keep adjusting that hedge book. Right. So when they initially put on the hedge, let's say they sell you the put, the Apple put, and they sell Apple as a hedge, making them zero exposure, theoretically your zero exposure, that's a delta hedge. But now when the market starts moving, that's a gamma hedge. Then they got a gamma hedge, which means that the gamma, as we said earlier in this foreign language lesson Greek, yeah. the gamma is the change in delta, which is the change in the option as the, the underlying stock moves. So the the uh, market makers, uh, when, once the position's on and the market moves, the market maker now has to gamma hedge it because now there's volatility that may be increasing or decreasing. There's 
interest rates moving. There's the Fed talking. There's numbers coming out. This is like the Wild West here, practically. It is. So, so they're constantly, constantly every so often intraday. They're right. hedging. They're, they're adjusting their hedge book. And that's causing movements in the market that people don't understand. And I think the media doesn't really understand it either because they say, oh, well, today the stock market was up on traders reevaluating the risk of the war in Iraq. In, uh, right. And it has Ukraine, nothing to do for with example. It. Right. But not to blast the media here, but it's not that's not always what happens. That's not why the market's moving. There's other reasons why the market's moving, some of which we're talking about right now, adjusting the hedge book. Actually, I think most of the time it's because for other reasons. It's like yeah. when I, normally, if I'm hearing on on one of the financial medias or even on the market wire that we get on our on our systems, that they're talking about that investors are this. I'm like, I always stop and I think to myself, which investors? Who are you talking about? Because again, even in my own updates, when I'm talking about it, and I'm talking about. A gamma explosion, or just that that as the markets move and it forces again, it forces the the options holders or the buyers or the sellers of those options. If you're long the option or short the option, and again, what Dan said is a very important thing that you're if you are a delta neutral trader and I'm selling you an out of the money put, which means it's like it's it has no intrinsic value, folks. It's, it should be trading at zero because I'm selling you a put that gives you the right to sell me Apple. And I'm going to just say at $140, it's trading at 146. Let's say what's the value of that put zero, but there's a time value attached to it. There are interest value, interest rate value, or just, you know, interest that you pay attached to it. There are all kinds of things that get attached to it, but, it's likely going to be like a 25 delta put. Now, as the stock actually were to slide, and so you, I sell you that, and then instead of having to say I'm going to sell it one to one, like one put is equal to, or you know, one put or call is equal to 100 shares of the underlying. All right. So I sell you one, but I'm not going to turn around and sell 100 shares of Apple. If I'm a delta neutral trader. I'm going to sell 25 shares if that's what the delta is. Now, Apple starts to, so essentially, I sell you that put that gives me long delta. I hedge that long delta by selling that equal number of shares, which is going to be 25 for this example. I sell that. Now, Apple starts to drop. What happens as it goes down? Because I've not sold it. I, I've, I've sold it delta neutral. I put the position on delta neutral. As it goes down, I get longer. So I have to sell more stock. I don't want to own that stock at 140. And now we're moving down towards 140. So what happens is your, your position grows against you. Now, if I actually had done one to one, sold you one put, one forty put, and sold a hundred shares of stock, Yahoo, Mountain Dew, go ahead, stock, drop all you want. And, but if you don't, then you're getting into what we call the gamma explosion. Then you're getting into what the delta works against you. So when Dan is talking about a hedge book, we have fund managers, we have CTA people, we have all these people that are working large positions and in various instruments. And the computer collects all that data and then tells that, that trader, you better do this. Or they're doing it algorithmically and the, and the computer just sends out the order. Adjusts, adjust your stock position, adjust your uh, position in the future or in one of the other instruments. Or in, if, it's, if it's based on an ETF, which we know there are a lot of ETFs that trade, and what's inside the ETF, maybe 25, 30, 40, 50 stocks, maybe a whole bunch of tranches of gold, maybe a whole bunch of tranches of, of bonds, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever in there, that's what they're going to start hedging with. That's what they have to hedge with. And then suddenly you see this movement in the market. So 
one thing can aggravate the next. But I think an important, what we're really getting behind the curtain is, is I, I would like to encourage people not to take a bullish or bearish posture because these traders that are out there doing this don't have that. Just like you said, they're not, they're not assuming bullish or bearish. They're trading at that moment. And this is what the pricing tells them. And this is what they tell it, it puts it to do. So even if they're trying to hedge, now they have to put that hedge into the computer. And as the market moves, they have to re-hedge. And maybe it's lifting a hedge or adding to it. Not only that, but you and I were talking about zero DTE options, zero days to expiration options. So every day combined with normal options for lack of any other word you have options that are expiring right or right. soon to expire and that really lights up those second order greeks like we were talking about and charm where as you go through the week let's say there's a friday expiration and let's say there's some thursday zero dtes those things are expiring at least the out of the money ones are expiring worthless or headed to expire right. worthless that changes the hedge book equation hugely so you might see a situation like where friday when we talked about the pce coming out the fav the uh, fed's favorite inflation indicator came out friday hotter than expected the market dropped but didn't really collapse like it could have part of that was we had a friday expiration we had zero dtes expiring we had volatility changing you know the vix index changing that all comes into the equation and what happens with the gamma hedging and all the stuff we've been talking about. So you got a situation where the market didn't collapse, but now those options have expired. We start again next week or this week. Now that we're almost to right. this week right. yeah. and here we go again, you know, it'll be the same story until some additional factor comes in. Maybe there's some headline or something that comes in that causes the macro traders we're talking about to come in and to buy or sell in a bigger way than they have right. been and bring the volume back. And then the market's really moving and starting to whittle away at the option structure and everything else that's happening. And then you get bigger directional moves happening. Right. And I think a very good example of what you're talking about is that on Thursday, we, we, we saw where there were large orders being placed on the buy side. And, so everybody thought, well, that's where we're expecting this move to kind of work its way down to. But what they weren't counting on is that we had the zero DTE options expiring on Thursday. And then the same situation happened again on Friday. And if people realize it's like, yep, they went down, they did a sweep, they took out all those standing orders at 39.50 in, in the ES. 15 minutes before the close. Well, that brought about some major adjusting to be done in a lot of the component companies, as well as the ES itself. And in 15 minutes, whoever had those positions on decided, nope, this isn't going to happen. And they ran it back and closed it above 4,000 for that expiration. Now we move to Friday. We get the PCE. They move the market down. No, it didn't crash, but it was basically holding lower. They knocked it, they knocked it, they knocked it. They went again down, filled some standing orders, put a little, went below that level. The show's like, yeah, we're still got some stuff to do. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, look up at the clock. Oh, it's that time of day. They made another shot at trying to get it back up. I thought at the time, and you and I discussed this on Friday afternoon, that, gee, are they going to try to get this back above 4,000 yet again? And then I quickly ran over and I looked at the options. And suddenly I thought, no, 39.75. What did they do? 39.75. They got it a little bit above. They got to close above so that those options were guaranteed to be exercised. And so when you look at the, the total picture of the option structure on any particular day or week, Right. You can look at, for example, like how many option positions are still open that haven't been closed out yet at a particular strike or a particular expiration. And, and if you graph that, you can get a picture of, uh, of a bunch of bars, you know, almost like a histogram of where the open interest is at which strikes. So right. 
uh, the the uh, strike with the most open interest, let's say thirty nine fifty on Friday. Uh, the put strike with the most open interest, that could be referred to as a put wall. Or, or the call strike with the most open interest could be described as a call wall. What that means is the market moves toward that level, like in Friday's case, thirty nine fifty, it was dropping. There's huge open interest at the thirty nine fifty level of expiring options, and the market tends to gravitate towards those levels and almost sort of a pin, you know, it's almost like people might say the market is pinning to that strike. So it gravitates toward that strike. It's the strike that's got the most open interest and that may be expiring if the market doesn't move through that level. And if it expires, that means anyone who's short that option could be market makers, whatever, may be happy because that option expired worthless and you're short. That's what you want. But then they have to adjust the rest of their hedge book so they got to lift maybe underlying shares of, let's say it's an Apple situation, an Apple structure, or it could be the S&P or the SPY and the Spider ETF. Um, they have to adjust those positions. And uh, that's why you get all this market movement coming then, in. Then they're the buying market. 500 stocks or selling 500 stocks or a combination thereof. I think this is important. That's a very important thing, what you just said, that, that I think that even even... If we're swing traders, day traders, it doesn't make any difference. This is what can cause massive movement in your underlying. And when if we take it out and we look at it on a weekly chart or, or even a daily chart, it may look like a fraction. But when you're in there trading it, folks, you know as well as I do, that it's like, oh, my God, what just happened? Did somebody drop a bomb? Did, did, did somebody just announce it, that they're whatever you know, the, to produce this, this action? It's like, no, they, nothing happened. It has to do with traders, hedge books, hedging. And okay, now that this is done and, and I'm not going to get exercise or I'm not going to be assigned, oh my God, now I got to re-hedge. If this is going off at zero and I had all these hedges on based on that, now it's there. Okay, what do I got to do now? Well, that's going to go out at zero. I guess I better re readjust. And sometimes I can force the market higher. And again, if it's in the S&P or if it's in the NASDAQ, they have to go to the futures market. Or if it's in the SPX, they're buying the basket. They're buying all of the stocks and their computers can, can put it together and just zip that thing out there in a heartbeat. Faster than the, When these all first came out, folks, we all had to do it in our heads. You had to walk up to your desk, to your trading desk, and you had to say, um... I need to buy X amount of this, X amount. And it's like, because no one could figure out the baskets. Well, now we have computers that do it on the fly and just send it out. And they do, that's what we see every morning. We see it all day long. If you're watching the tick, you can see how many issues are trading off the same way. And if it's a green number and if it's a plus, that's how many are getting bought. And then how many are getting sold. And you can see how an index will move Lickety split would say, for example, in the NASDAQ, in the NASDAQ 100, it can, that tick can only go plus or minus 100 because there's only 100 stocks. But when you're looking at the broader market, which is what, 2,500 in, in the uh, Russell 2000 or, or 2000 there, but in the broader market, I, I can't remember the, 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 the basket size. I think it's upwards of like 2,500 or, or even more. So you'll suddenly see. In, in the tick, plus 1,000, plus 1,200, plus 1,300. Folks, that's a massive amount of money being injected or taken out at one time. And it's going to force the move in the stocks. And it doesn't mean somebody's getting bullish or bearish. It kind of surrounds back to what Dan has been talking about and what we're kind of trying to put together. Step behind the curtain and realize it's hedging. And as those traders, those fun guys, they don't have a choice. They don't have a choice unless they really want to lose all their money. They have to hedge. It's how they make their money. Exactly. And they're, they're, the market makers aren't, per se, aren't here to speculate on market direction. That's not why they're putting that trade on. They're making a market. You buy a put, they're selling it to you. Now they've got a short put. They got to deal with it. So. Once these positions are on, 
let's say they're short a put and they sell Apple underlying the Delta hedge it off. Now the market's moving. Now you got to gamma hedge it. So what happens then is they're moving in and buying or selling the futures, depending on what's happening. Because when Globex opens at 6 p.m. Eastern every night, every market night, the, the stock exchange is not open. So they're not really able to, nor do they want to go in and start buying and selling Apple or Apple options. They got to deal with futures. Right. So there's a big gap move in the futures. And then that carries into Monday, let's say, or any day during the regular trading hours. They've already been in the futures market making some adjustments to their hedge book. And that's called gamma hedging. And that's why you see a lot of movement in the futures that's not related to what maybe the financial media broadcasts as the reason for today's move. It might be that there's gamma hedging going on and there's a lot of speculators and whatever else is going on, hedgers in the futures market. But these markets are all so interrelated now. And what you and I were talking about at the beginning of this broadcast with respect to options volume on many days in the last couple of years, exceeding that of the stock exchange volume, you're seeing a lot of these markets moving around. And that's what's become so important. If You may never trade an option in your life, but they're moving the markets around. And you may not have to understand it to the depth we've been talking about, like right. Greeks, second right. order Greeks and gamma and all that stuff. But I think it, it behooves you to understand that something's going on with respect to options trading. And, and this is helping move the market. In fact, Michael, it's so important that it's another one of our reports we're going to publish on defendingyourmoney.com. This whole concept of what's really moving the market these days. We're, we're right. tentatively calling it volatility unplugged. What's really moving the stock market these days? And we know that the Fed moves it by what they say and what they do. But there's other things happening here. You and I have been touching on a lot of it today. It's so important that I think even if you're never going to trade an option in your life, and they do involve risk, so maybe you don't want to trade them. But if you're never going to trade an option in your life, they're still moving the market around. Absolutely. And I'm going to try to wrap this up because the other thing, folks, I really, Dan and I are very trying to be consistent. I'm trying to limit our conversations, but not limit them in that way and, and scope, but just in terms of time. And so I've been very good about uh, paying attention to the time. So I'm going to try to wrap this all together for us because it's an ongoing conversation. There's just so much, and but there's only so much we can say and actually get it published. So in terms of because of the time, I, I love this conversation because what I bring up a lot of this in my own updates, and I know you do as well. And what we tend to wrestle with is how do I explain it? How do I really try to make this clear? And the best that I can do is tell people, I do not approach the market with a directional bias. So I don't, I'm not bullish. I'm not bearish. I just, I'm just trading. And, and by, if you can really adopt that and, and hang on to it, it gives you the opportunity to go with the flow. I don't care if they buy it or sell it. Just let me get my trigger. Let me, because I have my indicators and then, and when I get that signal, go trade with it. So it, then it breaks down to something else that I try to add. That's like, you got to have your trade rules and you follow your rules because the market is so whippy right now, as you very aptly have said many times that, you know, you could be thinking you've got this thing all tied up and it turns and flips and goes in the other direction. You're like, okay, I'm not sure why they did that, but I just got a signal. I got to get out of the trade and I got to go do the opposite direction. And then maybe in the next 30 seconds, they change it back. This is how fast it's changing. So you got to try to stay within that frame of mind so that you don't get buried. So the, the concept of, well, I'm going to, I'm going to go short because you think the market's going to go down. It's like, mm, you may not want to do that. I still am going to present my the picture, right? I'm still going to say that according to the, what I'm doing in Elliott Wave, the market should continue to go down. But the tomorrow, folks, they may decide that they want to take it up 100 or 200. What do we do then? You're going to complain to me that, oh, you you we went short. And now I got buried. It's like, mm, yeah, trade by your rules. Have your trigger, have your target, 
and know when you're going to get out when the trade becomes invalidated. And I use the word invalidated, not when you're wrong. Because if you got in on the same basis, you had a trigger, you had a target, and you're going to get out when the trade becomes invalidated. Now you're trading without a directional bias. And you're able to move within what's happening. That's where I'm going to conclude. I'm going to ask you, if you is there anything you want to add to kind of tie it up? And then we'll, we're just going to close up for today. No, I think it's been a great discussion, Michael. I think one of the things that's been happening, as you and I have alluded to today, is that there's been a lot of days with this thin, thin and the, the so-called macro traders don't seem like they're here. The macro trader being the one who looks, the traders and investors, institutions, whoever, who right. look at the whole macroeconomic picture and make a decision, either fundamentally or maybe maybe it's based on technicals, as opposed to those trading because of the option structure or their hedge books or whatever. So the macro trader has been kind of absent. But once the macro trader comes back, I think we're in for some big directional moves. And that, that could be us fairly soon because yeah. we're seeing a situation where the market, based on the S&P 500, for example, has been pivoting around the same level since last June. I mean, we're talking, what, seven, eight months? Yeah. Pivoting around the same level. But it hasn't taken off and it hasn't collapsed. The fact that it hasn't taken off may mean that the market's just not ready to bottom yet. So the point is, I think, though, that when macro traders return, when there's some sort of catalyst or headline or whatever that brings them back in, then you're going to see some big directional moves that could whittle away at the option structure, even that we've been talking about. Otherwise, it's day by day here until day we day see what's day. going on. Day by day. Well, thank you. I know we're going to continue the conversation and we're going to be adding to it. Uh, again, today, folks, we just kind of wanted to step behind the curtain to give a little bit more insight into what is creating the moves that we're getting and how do you want to deal with that. And having an understanding of what's creating them, whether you trade options or not, may help you intraday. And that's what our hope was. So, Dan, thanks for coming in today. Thanks for checking Thanks it out. Thanks for having me again. Today. Yeah, it was a good one. It was a good one. Um, again, I want to just say, if you have any questions for Dan, he's like me. He loves to get the emails. He, he will always answer you. And then you can contact him at info at defendingyourmoney.com. If you have any questions for me and you want to contact me personally, you can contact me at using my email address, which is michael at mjf1partners.com. I always answer my emails. I always will answer your questions. Or you can just in our comment section here on YouTube, once this gets posted, leave a comment, leave a question. I will come back to you. I will answer you. So again, thank you so much. And I'll catch you on the rebound. And we'll do this again, likely next week, if not before. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good one.